I don't know if it's my warped uh, and droll scent of humor, but there's so many spots in the Holy Scripture that I find very, very humorous indeed. Uh, today's gospel lesson uh, follows Christ's conversation with a group of Sadducees. Now the Sadducees, they don't believe in the resurrection. So they try to trick Jesus with an unlikely scenario. Um, there is a woman whose husband dies and she marries the brother of that hus uh, husband and so on and so forth until she's married seven brothers. And the question is, whose bride shall she be in the resurrection? So yes, they're trying to entrap him. And he quotes a portion of the scripture to the Sadducees. Now remember, the Sadducees only use the first five books, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, okay. And so he quotes from the scriptures that they hold to. Concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read, Jesus said, what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Foiled again. So, of course, then you have the Pharisees that are kind of on the side thinking, okay, all right. Yeah, fair enough. All right. We've got a lawyer here in our midst, a scribe, lawyer. Let's send him in. We've got a plan. So the lawyer goes up to test Jesus, which is the greatest commandment in the law? <clears throat> when you think of this question, what is the greatest commandment in the Old Testament? I got thinking about that. You know, today there's so many people that think of God as this vengeful, hateful, hurtful God that's got the smiting stick out and is already or just about to smite everyone. But often the Old Testament is completely ignored because of this idea of God being wrathful and vengeful, which seems to be for some people seen in the Old Testament especially. But this comes from the Old Testament, which is the greatest commandment. Jesus is Christ our God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. Love. Love God. Love neighbor. This is Christ our God's message then and now. Love. But we humans tend not to listen, or we don't really care that much, or we get confused, maybe confused about the message of repentance, thinking that we somehow need to appease God, to move God somehow, if we might, from a state of hatred and anger towards us to love us. But Jesus is crystal clear in this. And I really like this account as given in St. Mark's Gospel because we get a little bit more information there. Here's Christ's words. The scribe said to him, It is well, teacher, that you have said that truly God is one and there is none other, and to love God with the whole heart, soul, and strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is more important than any whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw the lawyer had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. So Christ our God is love. Christ Jesus is the incarnate love of God. God is love, God is kindness, God is mercy, 
even when folks are maligning him, even when people are trying to entrap him, even when people are trying to make up a Christ or a God the Father of their own mind, their own way and their own truth, trying to embarrass Christ, trying to embarrass the children of God the Father and to make them look like fools. Well, maybe all be called fools, but fools for Christ. Jesus starts with love. He doesn't beat the lawyer over the head angrily and call him names, get upset with them. And this is how the church in a fallen society is able to bring more people to actually meet with and understand who this God is. We do this through love. We don't do it through forceful debates. We don't do it as some would say, it's got to be done through Christian apologetics. No, that's simply philosophical argumentation. It always falls short. We do so with patience. We don't do this with a plethora of philosophical arguments and convincing and brow beating of the other to finally say, gosh, you've got such a, you got such a point there. I guess I got to believe. That's not faith. That's the belief of what the other person says has brought forth from the other person's mind. It's not bringing you to meet a person. It's bringing you to meet an idea. What is the consistency of the Lord's message to us? in the Old Testament and the New Testament alike. Is there anything there that we can mine out? Well, from the Old Testament, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. That's Deuteronomy 6. That should sound familiar. Leviticus 19, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Why? For I am the Lord. That's why you love the neighbor as yourself. St. Paul to the Romans, indeed these commandment, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other commandments exist are all summed up in this very saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not harm a neighbor, love therefore is the fulfillment of the law. St. James, however, if you fulfill the royal law, the law of love found in the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, and in doing so, you will do well. Well, if we're thinking about those verses and, and think, yeah, yeah, I can do that. Sure, I can do that. Love my neighbor as myself. Yep. Love God with all my heart, soul, mind, strength, resources. Yeah, I can do that. Then we also have to look at the verses in Holy Scripture because we have to take Holy Scripture as a whole. But I tell you, Jesus says, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who mistreat you and persecute you so that you may be children of your Father who is in heaven. There's always a why. Why do you do this? Love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who mistreat you and persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father who is in heaven. God the Father wants all to come to salvation. It's up to us if we want to be salvation on this earth. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Does that sound like someone with the smiting stick out that's ready to get you? Are these the words of a cruel and a, and a distant creator that kind of wound things up as a watch or a clock and then walked away from it all and left us on our own? 
But I tell you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, so that you may be children of your Father who is in heaven. Do you know who read these words of Holy Scripture while they were in prison? Nineteen ninety-nine in the Middle East. You've probably heard of him or seen of him recently. Mossab Hassan Yosef. Name sound familiar? The son of one of the founding members of Hamas. He was speaking to a British missionary in nineteen ninety-nine and asked him about these words. How is it that the God of Christianity says this, but Allah and the prophet fall short in this? One prophet fulfills, the other prophet of God falls short. And it became part of who he is to this very day. In 2005, he was baptized. He left the West Bank and he now travels the world. He's spoken several times to the United Nations and he speaks the truth in love, yet his words are difficult to hear. Christ Jesus is holding the reality of love God, love neighbor, do not hate. If you need to hate anybody, hate the old self that you are before baptism. And if that character wants to show up, hate that person back out the door. <coughs> To love with all of one's heart means to desire nothing but God and God's holy will. And the heart is the center of the soul, according to the scriptures and the teachings of the saints. That deepest reality of a person, the foundation and guide of a person's life. Who and what's in a person's heart? What or who? The human heart desires, determines the whole life and the whole activity of that person. Love God, love neighbor. The entire law and prophets hang on these two commandments. Everything in the commandments has the purpose of building up of love for God and neighbor. How important is love? We know that passage all too well from St. Paul to the Corinthians. If I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and have all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all my goods to feed the poor and give my body so that it will burn, but do not have love, this profits me nothing. Love. You know the name Saint Peripherous? Add the two words of Gaza. There's a church named for him in Gaza. He brought the gospel to Gaza. Hear his words. This is from a sermon he preached. Christ is joy, the true light, happiness. Christ is our hope. These are the words that people there and their descendants have heard down through the ages. And there still remains a pocket of probably around 2,000 Christian people that are trapped alongside the others in Gaza. 
Christ is our hope. Our revelation and our relation to Christ is love. Suffering for Christ, enthusiasm, longing for the divine and the eternal. Christ is everything, he is our love. He is the object of our desire. This deep longing for Christ is a love that cannot be taken away. This is where joy flows from. Christ himself is joy. He is joy that transforms you into a different person, a spiritual fool for Christ. Fast as much as you can, attend as many liturgies as you can, and you like, but in all things be joyful, my brothers and sisters. Have Christ's joy, the joy that lasts forever. It's free for their offering that brings eternal bliss. The joy of our Lord that gives assured serenity, serene delight, and full blessed blessedness no matter the situation in life. All joyful joy that surpasses every earthly joy. Christ desires and delights in scattering joy and enriching the faithful with joy. This is what the church is. This is the direction we must take. Christ is paradise, my children. What is paradise? Who is paradise? Paradise begins here and now. One thing is our aim, love for Christ, for the church, for our neighbor, love, worship of, and craving for God. The union with Christ and with the church is paradise on earth. Love towards Christ and towards one's neighbor, towards everyone, including our enemies. The Lord speaks, repent and turn from your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. Cast away from you all transgressions which you have committed against me and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God, so turn and live. A new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. How oh, easy it is to have words like those perverted by those across the street, those across the kitchen table, or those across the world. We can't fix everything in this world, but we can fix and bring about the gospel, the good news. We can bring about salvation to those that God presents before us each and every day. That is our battlefield within the human soul to do God's will in God's way and in God's timing. I do not know what you, I do not know what I will be called to in the future. It may not be much, it may be huge. God knows, but be willing to hear his call and to answer his call to love God and love neighbor as yourself. The neighbor includes our enemies, yes. That's the point of Christ's parable of the Good Samaritan. Love your enemies. That's his teaching on the Sermon of the Mount. God's love pouring forth from the faithful church is expressed in deeds, not words alone. God's love is expressed through what one actually does in our life. God's love is manifested in concern for others through kindly speech and generosity with one's earthly possessions. Because as Stan Buddha used to say, it's all God's anyhow. God lets you keep 90%. God's love is revealed in one's works of faith in keeping with God's commandments of being watchful of the worldliness that tends to filter in the evil one speaking on one's shoulder. 
By this we know love, that Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for others. What does that mean, that we ought to die? Yes, to self. Not drop dead on the floor, but die to who we have been. Die to all that keeps us from closer union and communion with God. That's our calling. We do that by way of the Holy Spirit working within us. Put to death the old person, as St. Paul would say. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees others in need, yet closes their heart against them, how does God's love abide in that person? Little children, let us not love in word or speech, but in deed and in truth. Yes, we look across the ocean, we look onto the Holy Land, but we do not judge. That's a very difficult place to be. The love of neighbor as oneself is so often misunderstood. One should love oneself in the sense that one is faithful to God and grateful to God for his or her life. One should love your neighbor as yourself in the sense that you and they are uniquely important in the eyes of God, the object of God's own unfailing love and mercy. For God so loved the world. This is loving the other as oneself because the other is oneself, meaning uniquely human, created in the image and likeness of God, and the other is infinitely loved by God and has the same opportunity for salvation as you or I do. That is the battlefield. That is the mission before each and every person who calls Jesus Christ Lord. To live this way, I would say in these times, in these last days, well, it's impossible, it can't be done. But the church does know that with God, all things is possible. That there is joy in the brokenness and sadness of this earth. Do not despair. God is with us. He is and ever shall be. And Jesus is reminding us constantly, calling us to the love who is God. Love even for those that hate and persecute you. Calling consistently, repeatedly to those, the likes of you and me, and those around the world. And if we're willing to hear, if we're willing to take the time that we can set aside and say, I give you this time because you are you and you have given the world me. So I give back this time to you and I wait and I listen for the words that come from your love, from the depth of who you are, that connects in the depth of who you have made me as a human person created in the, your image and your likeness. And what you will hear are these words, be not afraid. For I have overcome the world. You have my joy, and my joy is complete, no matter what you see beyond your nose. Amen. Amen.